Record, starting recording. Three, oh, three, two, one, click. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 97 of the podcast, the security podcast. I'm in 30. We're talking brand new systems. Both of us just got a brand new system, and we want to figure out what do you do with it? And I think we touched on this way before, but you know what? Thanksgiving's in a few weeks away. This is good for the the parental units where you have to fix their computer. But I just got a brand new, gorgeous 5K 27-inch iMac. And Tom got something. He'll explain. And we're just going to talk about what should you do with both systems when you first take it out of the box. So, Tom, let's go. Well, the first thing I do with any brand new system is you have to make sure you've got Java. And not just any Java. Pick like an old version of Java. Go find the oldest version of Java you can. Do the same thing with Flash. Next, make sure to turn off all of your automatic updates and place passwords.txt on your desktop. Keep all of your passwords there. That's, that's really the big three items we're going to discuss today is, is how to lock down your system in that fashion. No, well, don't scare people. <laughs> don't actually believe that. that no, was, no, that was awful. That was the worst um, advice anyone could give. But that's what happens. Yes. You take it if you pay the thirty-five dollar optimization fee that the big box stores sometimes uh, offer you. They're not much better with, with uh, than what Tom just said. Right. So you want to start off with what you got? Yeah. So I actually, um, if you hunt around on eBay. Uh, you can actually find some pretty decent deals on business-style laptops. Uh, and if if you like running your own system, if you like installing your own operating system, if you're not just going to go out, buy something from the store, and use it as is, if you're technical at all, I highly suggest going to eBay uh, and taking a look at some business-class laptops that you can pick up. Uh, this laptop behind me is the uh, the Dell E4400. Uh, it's uh, let, me, let me disconnect everything here. It's nice. It's pretty. It's uh, you know got got a mountain in the background. Uh, I'm running Debian on it. Um, why I recommend business class laptops is they are built for IT departments. They are built to be taken apart. They're built to be uh, you know to have their parts stripped out and shared with all of their brothers and sisters that are just like them in the enterprise. Uh, and it's usually easy to get in the BIOS, muck around, and do stuff like that. Uh, the parts are easy and cheap to come by. Generally a better experience than most consumer laptops you're going to find at your big box stores. I've, I've taken apart an incredible amount of those laptops, and they're always horribly difficult to get a part to replace things in uh, and to even find the parts for if, if you're not searching for something as simple as well I need a hard drive or a stick of RAM if you're trying to replace a fan or you know I, I hope not but if you have to replace you know uh, something on the main board something not common something you wouldn't find on a shelf uh, you're probably out of luck most of the time well, I froze. My picture's frozen. Hopefully it comes back. But <laughs> but one of the things people didn't realize is when Dell went enormous, the dude you're getting a Dell guy time. I mean, so seven years ago, eight years ago, I mean, I remember I was starting yeah. college at that point. So it's a little longer than that even. But they were made proprietary. So you wanted to swap something out or you wanted to – like gone were the days where you could just buy a hard drive and say, oh, let me just stick in this new hard drive. It may have not fit. I mean that was that was shocking to me. You buy these commodity uh, boxes, laptops, whatever, and they were almost. I mean, they were not as impossible to fix as they were now, but they were. They that was the pathway down. So recommending a business class laptop will cost you more money, but you're going to be able to swap out more parts if it breaks, and it's gonna it's gonna help you more in the long run if you're a tinker. If you're not a tinkerer, you want to find the most value, the most reliable, most whatever laptop or PC that you can find. Where if you have to do something, it's easy. But like if you want to swap, if you're not going to swap out the hard drive, you're not going to really swap out the RAM. You're not going to swap out displays. You're not going to swap out this. You know what? Find the most reliable, the most well built, and go from there. Which may be the business class laptops, like you said, anyway. Right. Gen generally, with laptops, because 
uh, I mean, most laptops today, you're, you're looking at the $400 range for what most people buy today. And it's really, it's an awful thing when you spend 400 bucks on a laptop because you're going to replace it in six months to a year. Uh, most laptops priced in that range are going to fall apart really, really quickly. And I realize this isn't strictly security, um, but one, one component of security is the availability of your data, of your computing resources. And if your laptop falls apart in six months, you know, it's not available anymore. Uh, so if you're looking at consumer brand laptops, something brand new that you're buying from a store, it's painful, but look at a thousand bucks and up. Don't spend three grand on a laptop that's ridiculous and you're losing a bunch of money. But you know, a thousand bucks, twelve hundred bucks, even up to fifteen hundred if you're looking for something with dedicated graphics isn't outlandish. Um, speaking of brands, uh, you know, stay away from Acer. Stay away from Toshiba under a thousand bucks. Asus, even Asus's uh, cheaper line at the seven hundred and above line, uh, you know, seven hundred to eight, uh, they're generally pretty well built. Uh, Dell doesn't make bad systems for seven hundred and up. I can't recommend HP after having enough bad experiences with their hardware. Um, but you know, if if you're in the market to replace parts and keep things working. I highly suggest uh, a business class laptop. And look online, look on eBay. Um, it's, returns are generally easy, and PayPal will fight for the buyer. But you know, your your mileage may vary. Uh, well, I know I've seen some great deals on there. My issue is, well, look, there's two trains of thought, and I think you have the right train of thought. You can either buy infrequently, so buy yourself a $1,500 laptop, whatever, spend the money that's reliable. And it's going to, you're going to get three to four or five years out of it. Look, my uh, $1,300 MacBook pro crossed the six year mark and it's still good. I just said, you know what? I mean, that, that's, it's, it's great. It's still working. But if you're in, if you know what you're doing and you don't mind the really cheap parts, you can get away with a $400 laptop with horrible battery life. That's going to break in 18 months. But every 18 months is not necessarily a bad idea if that's the route you want to go. So, I mean, I, I much rather the longer, the longer shelf span because it's really annoying getting a new machine, even though that new machine feels always good, but knowing that it's crappy to start with and having to go from there, I much rather get a feel the feel the great love once every five or six years and know I have a, t a solid machine. Right. And it's generally the easier route. Now, I do have to say this, and I'm going to say this up front because I've done this on several occasions now, uh, and it has never failed me. Um, if you are buying a laptop for a relative, especially an older relative, please consider a, uh, a, consider a Chromebook. They are easy. They're secure. They keep themselves up to date. And... I haven't run into any deal breakers with them. Uh, the biggest thing I can think of is uh, the Picasa desktop app does not run on a Chromebook. You have to use the web version, which is a little jarring to someone not used to it. Uh, but other than that, um, in the four instances I've bought Chromebooks for relatives because they only use Facebook and Gmail, uh, you know, my support calls have just tanked. I no longer get called because someone's machine blew up or because they opened an attachment. Uh, you know, I, I get called because, hey, have you seen this cool new Chrome app that, that I, you know, found on the web store? Um, fantastic idea. And they keep themselves up to date. So you don't even have to worry about security at that point. For the most part, teach them about phishing. <clears throat> well, I mean, I've heard people say only buy a Mac because I don't want to deal with uh, with uh, what I don't want to deal with the updates. But anyway, like Tom said, find out you're the person that people are going to be asking you for. So if they if they're only using email, like you said, and they're only doing this, then you know what? Try and sell them on a Chromebook. Try and sell them on something that's auto updated or something that you can fix simply, not something that's really complicated. Here's the thing. You're not going to get someone who sees the ads uh, for Black Friday in a couple of weeks for a $200 laptop and convince them that a $1,500 thing is the right idea. You may be able to convince them that a Mac may be the right idea or a Chromebook, but you're not going to get them to do it. So 
you got to hedge your bets. You may tell them, hey, look, I know this is a harsh thing, but I'm not going to fix it if it's there. It's, it's Tech support is going to be really difficult. Spend the money. I will help you. We'll find the right thing. But for the most part, the cheap commodity things, you're going to be the tech support person for. So if you can go higher up the quality, everything else, you're going to get a much better system. And you're not going to get called as much, which is always a good thing. So, Yeah, I, I can't even uh, even begin to... You know, uh, recount the tales of the t of the uh, time I've spent trying to fix, you know, two hundred dollar Black Friday laptops or or fifty dollar Black Friday tablets. It's just a an absolutely awful experience. Um, yeah, the the fifty dollar tablets are probably amongst the worst to troubleshoot because they're running some weird version of Android. But you know, let's say let's say something gets bought or you buy something yourself. We have to talk about securing it. So let's go with, before we do that, let's talk about, let's say my iMac. So, cause we talked yeah. about the PC. So I bought, like I said, the 5k, all the, 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 the really expensive iMac. I realized I don't really need a laptop. A Chromebook works perfectly for me. Like I said, what do you use it for? And yes, I like to tinker and everything else, but I like to tinker in a nice comfy chair and, uh, and, to sit on a laptop with a small screen doesn't do it for me. But I do like to have something that I can be on the road with because I think we found out that iPads are really, and tablets are going going away for the most part. People do want the laptop. But I realized I don't do much with it. So I got this nice iMac. And the good thing about the Mac is that Apple takes care of everything. You can send somebody to the Apple store and let Apple help with them. They control the hardware. They control the software. But you're going to pay the Apple tax. It could be... A, I mean, it's sometimes it's their MacBook Airline, maybe like fifty dollars more than a comparable Intel, uh, like uh, a laptop. But it's it's you get you get the updates from Apple. They do update it. You get the software from Apple. You can go there. There's no you don't necessarily need to go to the support forums, but you have to like Apple. And either way you go, look, I much rather people get for me an Apple computer that I can troubleshoot because I know that the viruses are not, they're not non-existent. They're just not as prevalent as with the PCs and they're updated way more easier than, than having to configure all the automatic updates on windows. But again, that's me. And, and the Apple way for people who don't know necessarily what they're doing may be sometimes a slightly better way. Yeah, for for the Macs, they've actually got the benefit now of you know Apple trying to channel everything through the Mac App Store. Uh, you know, hey, do you want uh, you know uh, an FTP program? Well, pull it from the Mac App Store, and just like iOS or Android, we will automatically streamline updates into your system. It is very very easy. And if you tell people, hey, only install things from the App Store, you know that they're going to keep getting updated. Unlike your Windows apps, which a lot of the bigger ones are great about auto-updating. Firefox, Chrome, they keep themselves up to date, they keep them, themselves secure. Uh, Windows as a whole, Microsoft makes it stupid easy to configure automatic updates. It's even out of the box in, in Windows. Uh, I want to say they started doing that in uh, Vista, just enabling automatic updates out of the box. Um, so you really don't have to worry about Windows for the most part, as long as they don't turn that feature off, God forbid. Um, but, you know, for, for some of the smaller apps for, oh, well, I'm just going to download the Solitaire game and double click it on my computer because I think it looks cool. That's horrible and people still do it. Uh, but even if it's a legitimate program, if it connects to the web, if it's insecure, if it, you know, offers all kinds of horrible buffer overflows and stuff that people can exploit and it probably comes with adware, you know, it, it most likely will not keep itself up to date. And that's the thing you have to watch out for. Well, well, yeah. So, but the good thing about the business class laptops is that generally they get rid of the cruft. When you get a business class laptop from Dell or HP or wherever, they're generally stripped down. You don't have any 30 day trial versions or anything like that, which is, which is excellent. The problem is you're going to pay. So the reason they got the prices down, just as an FYI, is because Norton is subsidizing the cost or McAfee or whatever else. Everybody's subsidizing the cost by getting their software pre-installed on your menu bar at the bottom there, just so you can load the program half a second, a split second faster. The problem is with all this loaded, it really, really bogs down your machine. And the next step we're going to talk about is how you should really wipe it clean and start over. 
Right. Uh, and uh, w one of our live viewers uh, actually pointed out that, you know, if, if you're loading apps from the Mac App Store, it makes moving to a new Mac really easy, just like moving to a new iPhone. You're going to log in, all your stuff's going to stream in, and you'll be done at that point. With a Windows machine, it's a little more complicated. Well, so that's sort of a misnomer. He's right, and that's exactly how it's supposed to work. But this is what actually happens. The first thing you want to do with your Mac is you want to do, you want to set up Time Machine to back everything up. When you get your new Mac, yes, it's going to say, do you want to back up from there? And yes, you're going to hit backup from Time Machine or restore from Time Machine. Then you're going to log into the App Store and do it. The problem is, and this is very deep rooted, is that the Mac App Store is awful. What happens is they have a rule that all apps must be sandboxed. So for security, that's awesome. They can't talk to anything else. But if you're doing some sort of, if you're writing an app that has to share with the outside world, sandboxing doesn't work, and then you can't be on the Mac App Store. So, so let's say taking Tom's audio and trying to feed it into a podcast app, it's not going to work. It will only record your thing because it can't talk anywhere else. So a lot of apps and app developers are moving away from there because it's just so hard for them to meet these requirements, and now... And now you have some from here, some from there, some from everywhere. And the Mac app stores just download, but the others you have to go out and get again. Interesting. So on the PC side, you've come home, you went to a big box store or wherever, you uh, you bought a business laptop on eBay like I did. Yeah. Do, do you think that I'm going to use the, the fresh Windows 10 image it came with and they said, oh, yeah, well, we totally just installed this. No. No, no, no. Especially if you buy used, do not use someone else's image. You have no idea what they put on there. You have no idea what they got and they don't know what's on there, right? You, you just, it's coming from an unknown. And really, if you're buying a laptop from a big box store, you can assume the same things, right? You don't know what kind of trialware or crapware is going to come bundled in that machine and rear its ugly head later. You don't know if you got super fished or not, which do not buy a Lenovo. They do not give them any pennies whatsoever. They have violated their trust, and they should be considered malware out of the box. Do not buy a Lenovo computer. Um, so Windows. If you've got a Windows 7 disk, a valid Windows 7 disk, it's really easy to put it in there um, and just wipe the system clean. Uh, if you don't, you know, buying Windows 7, it's going to get harder from here on out because Microsoft wants everyone on 10. You can secure 10. You can keep it from talking to Microsoft, but it's annoying to do so. Um, there, there are alternative operating systems. I run Linux on all of my machines, uh, but it's not for everyone. Uh, if you can go out, buy Windows 7. I'm sure it's on Amazon, Newegg, uh, all the computer stores out there. Uh, go get yourself a nice disk copy, uh, and then just wipe it clean. Install Windows, uh, install the updates, which will take forever, but please install the updates. You can't do without them. Uh, and now you've got a great starting point to work with. Let me let me interrupt for a second. So what happens, so I know it used to be that if you hold down F2 on your HP or Dell, it uses the system image. And yes, we can argue whether the system image directly from the company is the right thing or not. I agree with you, fresh install is always your best option. But let's say the problem is, is that it doesn't come with a CD. Usually it's like a $10 add-on, which absolutely you want to buy. My question to Tom is, because you've done this more, can you just use any old Windows 7 CD and use the key from the bottom, like the bottom of the computer? It really depends on the model, the manufacturer's agreement. It depends on a lot of things. Um, if Chances are no. Um, you know, to, to give out a blanket answer. Chances are that won't work. Is it worth trying? Absolutely. You should totally try it, but most likely that's not going to work. Well, because the issue is, is that it's really hard to explain to someone why you need to pay $10, $20, $25, which is at some at some level a percentage of their computer, I mean, if you got a cheap one, and for exactly that, just to have the OS, when all you have to do is hold down F2 and an hour later you walk by and, yeah, you get some cruft, you get the Dell dock bar and this and that, but how hard is it to install some, just to go and uninstall some programs? or explain to them why all of that is bad and why you really do need a fresh start. But 
Yeah, if, if you don't have, you know, a Microsoft branded clean Windows 7 image, and, and we're not talking, you know, the disk that you can buy that comes with your computer or the system restore image, if you're if you're gonna use the image that Dell ships it with or even recover the image that Dell ships it with, uh, you're gonna get crapware pre-installed. You're gonna get, you know, at the very least, in the best of cases, the OEMs are gonna put a bunch of, you know, Dell utilities, HP utilities, Acer, Asus, they all come with, you know, a bunch of different tools that they say, oh, you totally need this. Uh, and they've all got their branded cloud storage now. Um, so you, you wanna do without that. If you're gonna keep with it, go into add remove programs, go down the list and it, it's, there are programs to help automatically do this. Um, I've seen some work great. I've seen some work terribly. I can't recommend them one way or another. Um, what I do, I go down the uninstall list and just remove anything that looks annoying or useless. You know, Dell Online Cloud Backup, get rid of it. Uh, wild Tangent Game Service, yeah, get rid of that. Uh, and then just get on the list one by one and uninstall them. If you don't know what something is, use uses your favorite search engine of choice. Yep. It will tell you what it is. The other thing you may want to do if you're technical or you're going to be supporting uh, the parental units is to create your own image, make a copy of it, buy a USB key, make your own image, put it somewhere in their house or you keep it, put it around, hide it someplace so you know where it is. So in Thanksgiving, on those days, you tell them or walk them through, put this put this USB key in, hit this key combination, let it start and it will do its thing. And I mean, that that was also, basically that's what Dell and HP and Acer and all of them did. They said, you know what? We're gonna partition off the hard drive so we don't have to deal with this all the time. And we're just gonna tell people, oh, to restore, just hold down F2 or F11 or F12 and go eat lunch and come back in an hour and you'll be up and running. You can do the same thing. It just is not gonna be that simple. You have to find the USB key and go from there. The other thing we can do, so after you've uninstalled it, you wanna go in, you wanna install the good programs. And I think Tom and I, I think both recommend Ninite, N-I-N-I-T-E, I think that's yep. it. What it does is you check off the boxes. These are vetted softwares. They're, I think all of them are open source or they're freely licensed. And you check off the boxes. They have the default install says, do not install any pop-ups, don't install any toolbars, don't install anything, don't run it anywhere. I think all they do is they make a desktop icon just basically to know that it's there, you can delete it. And again, you choose the programs, you download it, you double click. You hit yes to all the agreements, you go have lunch, you come back, your system is all installed. So, yeah, this, this is really one of my favorite utilities in Windows land. It is just fantastic. So uh, on their list, for an example, they've got stuff on here like Chrome, Firefox. Um, if you want something like Java, please do not install Java. Please, please, please do not install Java. You can, this gives you the checkbox to do it. Uh, you can pull things like VLC, like uh, the great audio program we're using right now, Audacity, uh, Spotify, QuickTime. Um, you can pull down Security Essentials or Malwarebytes or uh, Sumatra PDF, which is way, way safer uh, than uh, Adobe's uh, PDF reader. So if you can change it, change it. Um, uh, you know, they've got a bunch of open source stuff in here. They've got LibreOffice. If you don't pay, want to pay the Microsoft Office tax, they've got game stuff. They've got Steam, uh, Google Earth, KeyPass. It, there's a bunch of utilities. It's one double click. You double click. It says, oh, I'm going to go ahead and download everything and install it. The best part is uh, you can actually, this icon that they leave on your desktop, you can get rid of it. It doesn't do anything, except if you double click it again, it will look for any updates and it will pull, it'll automatically download and install the updates for you. Uh, it makes one or double click updating stuff just trivial to do. And basically, well, I do that on all my machines, even new machines. If it's a machine I'm going to take over and I don't feel like cleaning it up or I'm only going to be there for a few weeks, I'm, you know what? That's where I get a lot of my software from because you know what? They vetted it, it's there, and I it's one-stop shopping rather than having to remember all the different websites. It's it's it, it really is good. On the Mac side, like we said, you just put in your credentials or you go to the app store and you go from there. But for the most part, that's what we use for that. 
I guess the next thing you want to do is after you install, you have to update your machine. Either one, it doesn't matter what it is. I was gonna, I, I guess I suggest, or you suggest always updating your machine before you install any programs, just in case. Yes, yeah, just go go to the update manager. Uh, you know, click grab all the updates and go make yourself a cup of coffee, do your taxes, uh, cook Thanksgiving turkey, uh, do everything you can because it's going to take a while. Uh, but you have to do it. You have to update. Um, just get it out of the way and do it. Uh, and you're going to have to update the update. So after you yeah. update, they're going to download more and you're going to have to update again. Yeah. If you can, uh, you know, if, if you're a parent buying a laptop for a kid, you know, going off to college or whatever. Um, consider saying, hey, look, Christmas Eve, here's your laptop that I bought for you for college. You cannot use it yet. I'm just going to sit it here plugged into the router. So it's got a nice, fast, wired connection, and it's going to download all the updates. And tomorrow, you know, hopefully all the updates are installed and you can actually use the thing. Uh, so consider giving that present a little bit early so it has time to cook with the updates and it'll be nice and fresh uh, Christmas morning. You've done this with the PS3, the PS4, the Xbox, yep. the Xbox One. You open a Christmas Eve night or 6 a.m. Christmas morning and you're stuck there because it has to update and the servers just got hammered. Open it up the night before and go from there. But just remember that you do want to update. And updating is important. And you know what? This is a good conversation starter to say, hey, look, this is going to keep you safe. And we're going to go from there. I want to address the question of what's wrong with Adobe's PDF. Okay. Adobe ad, ad, viruses could target the virus makers, the bad guys. They target the biggest footprint. That's why yeah. Windows is more vulnerable than Mac. It's not that Mac is more secure. In fact, they've shown that it's not more secure. It's just who are you going to target? You're, you're going to target 5% of the population rather than 95%. And it's easier just to go after them. So Adobe is on every single machine. And so what they found with Hacking Team is the vulnerabilities in Adobe's version of PDF. Now, PDF is open source. So Apple, like we have here, uses Preview to do it. But if you want a third-party app, we uh, Qt, uh, Qt uh, PDF or um, Sumatra, as you said, all those you fox it's okay fox that's the one that i use fox it's good it's that's what they're doing same thing with java yeah. java is installed famously on three billion devices which has been three billion devices in the last five years yeah, I don't know, that's where's, terrifying where's the fourth billion device okay. <laughs> everyone's uninstalling it there's a rotation yeah so either way java is bad and it's java mainly in the browser you shouldn't be allowed to execute Java code on your machine through the browser. If Minecraft now famously comes with its own Java creation in there, but some people still need to run Java and they still need. So if that's the case, I'm a Java programmer over here. So at least don't run it in the browser, have it somewhere else or install it when you need to use it. That may be the best thing. And then uninstall it when you're done. Yeah, you can uh, you can actually in most browsers you can say, hey, you know, Firefox or Chrome, never run Java. You can keep it installed if you've got desktop apps or something that needs it. Hardly anyone needs it, so get rid of it if you don't. You probably don't. Uninstall it and see what breaks. And then the uh, last two minutes, so we have two minutes left. I was gonna say, now that you got everything perfect the way you really want it, and this could take hours, days, whatever, weeks. Right before you start doing anything sort of production where you care about stuff, just set up a backup solution. You got a brand new machine, set up a backup solution. If that's running Time Machine on your Mac, you go out, buy a, splitting, a spinning platter hard drive, or on the Windows side, I guess the Windows side has their own backup. I mean, Windows 7 they, is pretty They good. do. You, you got to make sure, just like Time Machine, you got to make sure you have a drive plugged in or something network accessible. Um, you know, go out, find find your favorite backup utility, whether it's Mosey or Carbonite or uh, CrashPlan. You know, I personally use CrashPlan. I have used Carbonite in the past. I know people who use Mosey. They all work pretty well. Um, find something that does offline backup that will use pre-internet encryption. I know CrashPlan makes it easy. You specify your own passphrase in there and encrypt your stuff and then hand it to them. I've restored tons of machines this way. Um, one one thing to mention, you know, uh, on the Mac, they're going to do this. Well, I guess they're both doing the same thing now. Uh, by default, you're running as a user with what I will call pseudo privileges. You can elevate to an admin. Uh, if you really want to be secure, uh, if you want to lock things down right, get all your stuff installed, 
get everything updated, get it set the way you want, and then create a new user account that cannot be admin, that cannot do administrative functions on that system, and use that as your default user. Because in the case that something gets owned or compromised on that user account, unless it's a zero day, unless there's some privilege escalation going on, uh, you know, the low level adware and stupid stuff that will happen is only going to affect that user account. You can blow away the user account, uh, create a new one, and your system's okay. Well, look, again, all these things we've talked about before, but it's a nice thing just to wrap it up together. And and when you're done with all of this, and I know it's going to take a couple days, a couple weeks, you know what? Have fun. You have a brand new machine. Play with it. But th always be smart. I just want to end it with that. Always say, is this the right thing? Is this the right security thing that you want to do? And then go from there. Anyway, we're out of time. We may want to actually continue this next week because we only got to the installing the updates part. There's a lot more that needs to be done. Oh, yeah. Know. So anyway, until next time, we will see everyone later. Bye, everyone. See you, everyone. And, oh.